right. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all today. And I thought it would be nice to do something special today. As we are on the precipice of making a change to our church service next week and uh, moving, shifting the times of the church service a little bit later and changing the format of the superintendent from more of a long form uh, part of the service to something a little bit of a shorter form, I thought it would be nice to talk to the, the superintendent speakers that we have and just talk to them about what they've enjoyed about and are looking forward to about sharing uh, during the superintendent time. So what I'm planning on doing is inviting them up one by one and uh, going through a little bit of a process of getting to know them better, what they've enjoyed sharing and such things. So we'll start off with a little bit of a prayer and then we will get started with, uh, we'll start with faith first. Heavenly Father, uh, we're glad for the opportunity to meet this morning as part of the Sabbath school service here. And uh, as always, we ask for your spirit to be with us. And we say this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Is it all right? We start with you, with you Faith? Yeah. All right, wonderful. This is for you. All right. So I'll just start off with um, an introductory question. So Faith, how long have you been coming to Centerville? We've been here about 15 years. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, what have you enjoyed about sharing during the superintendent time? Um, well, I enjoy, I, I guess why I wanted to do, I was asked to do it, I prayed about it. I have a lot of fear of being up front, mm -hmm. which most people don't realize I shake really bad, my heart races, I'm soaked in sweat. But I pray because I feel like if God wanted me to be here, then he'll give me the courage. And every single time the Holy Spirit gives me the courage to speak. And in my heart, I've wanted simply to my remarks to be something that would draw you to a greater love of Jesus and draw you to a desire, deepen your prayer life, help you to be ready to either serve him and for his soon return. And this has been my heart to do that. This is one of the reasons why I wear a jacket up front, because I sweat when I get nervous. <laughs> and I don't want to show off big stage. Uh, so uh, second thing is, what, are, what was one of like, the favorite things that you have shared? I would say probably the favorite thing that I shared, I, some of you might remember, but I had some old friends of mine come up from the Lima Church. Mm -hmm. And um, the gentleman that came up, um, he's from Brazil. Mm -hmm. And he may have been a little hard to understand, but his heart was so on fire for God. <laughs> and they had a little singing group, so they sang before, and then he spoke, and then sang afterwards. And as I sat up front, I said, God, <laughs> that was amazing. I just enjoyed hearing him talk about how much he loved Jesus and how much he wanted us. And so he, that was one of my favorites. Definitely. Is there anything on your mind that you're looking forward to sharing? Um, oh, for the net, for the upcoming. Um, well, we've changed the format, which I'm excited. Change is good. Mm -hmm. We're excited to see what God's going to do as we change our times. We're going to get about 10 minutes. So for me, this is going to be a challenge because um, I talk even more when I'm nervous. So I'm going to have to keep the thoughts to 10 minutes. But maybe those nuggets will be just as important. Maybe it'll be a nugget on prayer. Maybe it'll be a nugget on, um, you know, serving. I'm just excited. God's got a plan, so that means he's going to give each one of us what he wants us to share in those 10 minutes. Uh, and Angel, if you'd come up next. I just want to let you know I'm still in a bit of, uh, you know, just thrilled that Dr. Rodriguez is, is here with us. You know, he's just a little bit of hero worship, I got to say. I'm honored that he's here, as always. And um, so I want to ask you, as you sort of recently got into the rotation of superintendent speaker, um, what do you think are, are the benefits of having church members share during the superintendent time? Uh, we're used to have pastors talking mm -hmm. to us, and that's very good. Mm -hmm. And I spent most of my time talking to pastors and leaders. But I realized, I discovered that there is a wisdom, a, a, in fact, a profound wisdom in the minds of church members that we do not explore. So that the time that we had, that I sat there to listen to the superintendent or to anybody coming up here during that time was a blessing to me. And as you have probably noticed, I don't talk too much during the Sabbath school lesson. 
I want to listen to that wisdom that is, that is there that enriches me. And as we're looking forward um, towards the future, is there anything on your mind that you're looking forward to sharing? I believe that the heart of everything we do is the gospel, Jesus Christ. What I would like to, to do is to talk about how the gospel sustain us in our daily lives every day. When the church members go to work or meetings or anywhere, that, that the gospel strengthen them in their pains and, and, and their joys. I think we need to talk uh, more about this because it, it makes the gospel meaningful. You can see the gospel uh, walking and talking. So I, I think I would be doing something like that. All right, wonderful. If you could pass the microphone off to Shane. Thank you for your time. Shane, please. All right, and uh, Scott is overseas in Germany right now, and so I just want to share something from him that I, I got this morning as I had reached out to him. So, um, so Scott likes to share mostly things that have uh, touched his heart, and one of the favorite things that he has shared over the time that uh, he's spoken for superintendent uh, was an Adventist World Radio story of a man named Wissam. Uh, he was a Muslim but became an Adventist, and he went through a terrible time in his, his conversion. So uh, he was stoned twice, he was shot once, and his cousins tried to stab him to death. And so now he's an Adventist pastor in Nazareth, Israel, with the respect of the community. And there's um, several Adventist World Ra Radio uh, videos of it on this on YouTube, should you want to follow. One is titled, No Man Did This, you know, saying that God did that. Uh, and another is titled, A Powerful Story of Redemption. Um, and then ultimately, Scott wants uh, us to know that he just wants people to know that they can trust God with their lives. Mm -hmm. So Shane, how long have you been coming to Centerville? Uh, I think it's been about 20 years now, I think. I haven't done the math. I was trying to do the math when I was sitting there, but it's been so long. <laughs> it's been a minute. Wonderful. So what have you enjoyed about sharing during the superintendent time? Like the topics I've been sharing? Yeah, or, oh, what, topics or what, just in general. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like, my, my thing is just like, I really like just sharing what really jumps out of the Bible. Like my, my thing was like words, you know, how the, 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 the definitions of certain words, how it just deepens the impression of what the Bible is saying, you know? But I think overall my favorite topic was when I shared the testimony of my grandparents and how far like we've come since they were converted, you know? And um, I, I don't even remember what year that was, but that, that, you know, the thing is, is that that is what, what, what was one of the topics that gave me one of the most like responses from you guys. So anytime I share something and I hear back from you guys, then I know like you guys were touched from what I said. So that makes me excited about it, you know. So the, the fact that you guys, you know, heard this testimony and you're like, man, this is great, you know. You know, it just kind of like echoes what it says in Revelation. You know, they were they would overcome them by their their words of their testimony. So, just some for you guys. Uh, have you thought of anything? Is there anything on your mind that you're looking forward to sharing in the future? Actually, so I'm on next week, and um, it's going to be about death. So I'll leave that as a cliffhanger for you guys. Don't worry, Owen. It'll be a killer topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom, now that I have you here, thanks for coming, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So how long have you been at Centerville? Oh, man. So I moved to the area in 2011, and I think I was bouncing around between Centerville and Kettering for a little bit. Um, mostly attended here, spent a couple years at Beaver Creek, and then came back like 2018 or something uh, to be here at Centerville. All right. So what have you been uh, enjoying sharing during this time? I think maybe resonating a little bit with um, what Shane said and some of the others. I feel like if I resonate with something out of the scriptures, it's, pr it's going to have to at least resonate with someone else. And so uh, that gives me confidence as a speaker to get up here and say, okay, this was meaningful to me. It will be meaningful to someone else. And so I, I like to take that. And then I also like to take the Bible and make it make sense. Okay, so these are real people, and these are their stories and the real spiritual lessons that we can, we can learn from them. All right. So what's your uh, favorite... Uh, topic that you shared so far? I'm going to answer that slightly differently. So, like, I think I have, like, a, a format that I like. So I came across a, um, an L. White quote, quote one time that sh we shouldn't expect a sermon every week at church. 
And so I was thinking about that for a while. I'm like, okay, what can I do to do something a little bit different? And so for those of you that have been here uh, for superintendent, I have what I like to call like a hymn message where we take a hymn and we sing a verse and we talk about the scriptures in each. And it's a little bit different. It's a little more interactive, and we sing, and we think about the songs that we're singing, and, and that's something that I like doing. I remember that topic. It was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, last question, at least for me, that mm -hmm. I want to know. What is your favorite Bible pun? Favorite Bible pun? Oh, man. Well, the one that I go to. So um, uh, you guys know what car the disciples drove? Yeah, they were all together in one accord. Must have been crowded, I have to say. Can I have that mic back? No. <laughs> Get out of here. All right, let's see. Dr. Small? So, Dr. Small, how long have you been coming to Centerville? It's about four to five years mm -hmm. after about 50 years at Kettering. Oh, wow. We got a convert. Glad to have you. <laughs> Uh, so what have you enjoyed about sharing during the superintendent time here? I think it's been given, being given an opportunity to share some of the, the key points of our faith. You know, this world is not my home. There are things that happen that we don't... Here we go. There are things that happen that we don't like. Mm -hmm. But you know the assurance that we have through Jesus Christ... Mm -hmm. There is nothing I have to be afraid of. Amen. I will never be alone when I face problems. And, uh, you know, we look forward to the solution, the program I presented on heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, we, serving God has pays dividend, dividends in this life. Definitely. But it also, we have something extra special to look forward to and to share that and presenting a program means that I get to spend some time studying it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, do you have any like favorite things that you've shared over the years? Um, <clears throat> you know, a program on angels. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful to have a guardian angel. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fun when we get to heaven to talk with that angel and find out I'm sure there are a lot of times the angel has been of help to me that I'm not aware of. There are other times I do, I am aware of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be exciting. Definitely. Are any of you aware sometimes that you have angels helping you out? Yeah, definitely. I think the ones in vehicles stand out more so to me, but I'm sure there's plenty of other times also. <clears throat> do you have anything, any topics or any, anything in your mind that you're looking forward to sharing? I believe that if God, you know, as long as God gives us life and breath on this earth, mm -hmm. things are going to become more difficult in the future. You know, as we look around at the world, if I had to, to think my future is pegged to what's happening in the world around me, it would be discouraging. To share, you know, as problems come up, it's going to be exciting to see how God helps, to, helps us through those. I don't know what the solutions are. I don't know what all the problems are going to be. But I know that God's going to have some good surprises. You know, I often think of, of Moses, when Moses, his sin that kept him from going into the promised land, when he climbed that mountain and died, he was disappointed. He had no hint of what was going to come next. And you know, God has a way of, of springing surprises on us that may be a whale of a lot better than what we thought we wanted. Definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Small. And I'm now gonna invite Bill Perno up, and uh, we'll talk a little a bit about how, uh, what we're gonna be doing as a church with our timing moving forward. So uh, I want to start us off uh, with, with the changing church and Sabbath school times, uh, will there still be a superintendent time? Yeah, Tom, there certainly will be a certain time, and Faith kind of uh, pointed that out already, that the time is still here, just a little shorter format in time. Definitely. So uh, if I remember the church format, uh, first service will be from 9 to 10.10. 10. There'll be a 10-minute break there, and then from 
1020 to that 1030 spot. We'll have a 10 minute for, so you can saw it like a spiritual TED talk type of a thing. A lot of T's there in that sentence there. So how will the superintendent spot be used moving forward? Well, that's where the fun happens because Faith also mentioned that um, change is not a bad thing. But change with a purpose, Tom, is really what's important. So as we look at the worship services and why they're being adjusted so the church can continue to have guests come into the church and membership grow and our evangelism program really take um, complete grasp of the opportunity to grow this church, we have to think about how we bring people into the church. Mm -hmm. So as we thought about what would happen to this time slot, we quickly realized that it was an opportunity to have different topics, different subjects, and sometimes it's nice to hear from what I would call the subject matter expert. So what's gonna happen is we took the average month, Tom, and broke it up into four weeks. So week one every month will be a ministry in the church will come and share about their ministry, how they're reaching out to the community, what events are going into their um, program, as well as needs they might have, um, to keep you totally understanding how the value of their ministry is going forward in the church. That would be week one every month. Week two and week four will be our team of Sabbath school superintendents who you just heard from. Because of their passion and what they do, they'll still have the opportunity to share some of the things that you've heard each of them talk about wanting to share in the future. And what I really like about that is, is that what they share is from a passion standpoint. It's from their own personal growth. It's from their own experience with people. And today's format, frankly, is, was Tom's idea. And Tom thought of this, well, I think the Holy Spirit gave it to Tom. But because his heart was open, he said, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to make a great transition into the future. So finally, week three, I think I've had them all, week one, two, four, and now week three. Week three is going to be about, and I don't have my glasses on, so I'm going to test myself for a second, is going to be about church life. So everything you could think about church life, and I saw my wife just smiling down there because my glasses are around my neck and I just didn't put them on, but um, it's about church life. So it'll be about children. It'll be about uh, church family and the social life ministry. It'll be about evangelism. So it'll be a very wide topic. Also, every quarter, we'll also have the mission spotlight every quarter that'll play during week three. So that's kind of our new four weeks. And twice a year, there's a week five, and that's when our superintendents will politely fill into that week five going forward. So that's kind of the new format, Tom. Definitely. So in closing here, if you could just, in a nugget, what do you want the superintendent spot to be for the church? You know, sometimes it's nice to look at Tom's questions before you come up so you could have an answer prepared. Um, and, I, and I don't have one prepared, but I'll tell you, like the superintendents, we speak from our heart. So what we want this time to be is a value add to your Christian growth. We want our church to grow tighter together as a community inward, but we also want our church to have the power, the understanding, the education, the ability to go out and be a part of this community. That would be Kathy and I's hope. All right, Bill, thank you so much for your time. Thanks. I did. I thought I had a couple extra questions and I sprung them on, folks. Okay, a couple of housekeeping items um, as we're done. So this is the, the close of that particular section, but... Um, uh, I want to point our attention as a church towards the, uh, the prophecy series that we're going to have starting this Friday. So we have some handbills, and they're either in the bulletin, I think, or they're sitting out front, out front here at the church. And, uh, you know, we can pass these out to friends and to neighbors and to whatnot. And so this is, this is part for me, part for you. Uh, so out at the welcome station, I have some seminar registration forms. So for you, this is to help you register early. For me, I'm running registration, and I would love to test my system and make sure it works. So if you think that you might come at some point during our, our prophecy series, our, our two-week, two-and-a-half-week prophecy series upcoming, please register and fill out the form, and it will, it will save me time, me time, this is for me, on opening night, all the data entry, I can get that done ahead of time, and I can just make sure that my, you know, Google form and my spreadsheets and everything are all connected and they all work. So I would appreciate that very much. So if you think you might come, 
even if you're not necessarily 100% sure, even though I know you're going to, uh, stop by the welcome table over here and fill out a registration form. We had a paper form, and then for those that are so inclined, we have a QR code that you can scan and, and uh, use a Google form for that. Uh, so I don't have my bulletin with me and the different SAB school classes. Uh, I'm just hoping you know where to go today. We got Lindy in here. Lindy, are you teaching today? Uh, I think the mic's over there. And then uh, I'm drawing a blank on the others. So God bless and have an enjoyable Sabbath school time. Thank you. Are we on? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Um, how is everybody? Blessed. Praise Blessed. the Lord. Blessed. All right. Um, are there requests for prayer, thanksgiving, those kind of things? I'd just like to have a praise. Yesterday was Evelyn Lake. Birthday, we were able to get Olive Garden dinner to her because okay. she couldn't go out, and those flowers are in for oh, her. For Evelyn Lake, okay. She's probably watching. All right. Happy birthday, Evelyn. Okay, great. All right. Anybody else? Yes, of course, Stephanie. No, I'm not sorry. Um, please continue to pray for Todd. And um, I mentioned this last week, but you weren't here. Allie made a very hard decision to have her other foot amputated on Wednesday. So please continue to pray for her for her healing and her recovery, that it goes smoothly. And uh, I, there was a picture on Facebook. All seven of the children came to the hospital to see her. So. Please continue. I have a praise that all the kids and parents got home from Ireland safely, had a wonderful time, were a blessing to the Irish people, and so that was wonderful. And I would like to mention the movie Hopeful. Have you heard of this? I think I have. There's the movie Hopeful is the story of the Adventist Church starting. Okay. And it will be in theaters Wednesday and Thursday only. It is produced by Kevin Christensen, who went to Spring Valley Academy. Okay. And um, he was interviewed by John Bradshaw. It's on YouTube, and a trailer is there. 
and it really uplifts Mrs. White, and um, it, it, I'm excited to have our message presented yes. out there, yes. you know, sure. so. All right, thank you. All right, yes, go ahead. over the years since you guys have been gone, but all the uh, 30-year plus generation knows the taste, so that's great. Welcome, welcome home. All right. I'm very grateful that um, my husband, he was in Africa for about 10 days. It was a very lonely experience, but he had a great time. He preached the last weekend, I think, in South Africa, then went to Malawi and did some uh, work doing hearts in, in, um, in Malawi. So great time. Visitor. We have a visitor. Oh, Megan. we have a guest. Megan's going to be with us. Okay. And you are from? Collegedale, Tennessee. Collegedale, all right. And your names are? Ken. Ken. Okay, Ken. And there was Megan, you said also? Visiting my daughter, Megan. Okay. Last name is G-A-N-O. 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 Ken Gano? Gano. Gano. I suspected it was Gano. To go with my first hunch. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and uh, we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we are so grateful to have this special time with you. And we are grateful that you have given us your word, you've given us your son, Jesus Christ, and you've given us the Holy Spirit that speaks to our hearts, teaches us, encourages us, and uh, fills us so that we can grow into your image. We are grateful for the Seventh-day Adventist Church and for the calling that you have on this church. We're not just a church, actually, we're a movement. And I pray that as Seventh-day Adventists worldwide, we understand that fact, that this church was called for a purpose and we were actually for a movement. And we especially think about that this quarter when we're studying this specific topic that Seventh-day Adventists understand as no other and we pray that we're able to impart that in a humble and loving way to others. You've heard the requests of your people, the praises, the thanksgivings. We're grateful that the band and choir from Spring Valley Academy has gone and ministered and returned safely. We're also grateful for Evelyn's birthday that she just celebrated. And um, we just ask that you continue to be with her and be with her life. We are also grateful for those who have come to us for the first time, Ken, visiting his daughter, Megan, that he'll have a time here that makes him realize that this is a wonderful congregation and a, a wonderful place for his daughter. We're grateful that the Tate family has decided to return to Centerville, and they have jumped right into ministry, and nothing of, of that decision has surprised us. So we're grateful that they have rejoined our fellowship. We want to pray for Todd, who has been suffering um, with uh, lung cancer, and he's at the James <coughs> Hospital, that you'll continue to bring healing to his body. Yes. As Ali has made the difficult decision to have her other foot amputated, um, we've been praying for her now for probably over a year, and I just pray that you be with her and the family, that you will comfort them and fill her with hope for her future. Yes. We know that you love her very much. And so we're grateful that nothing takes you by surprise, uh, that you have a plan, and maybe trust your plans. Now as we have the privilege of opening your word, I pray, Lord, that you will open our word to your heart so that we can truly appreciate the things written here. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. All right. Okay, so this is the first lesson of a new quarter, and um, the one thing I'm grateful for this, with this change is that we do get to spend some more time in the lesson studying together, so we'll have a few minutes. Some people haven't gotten the quarterly, right? Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, the theme of the lesson this quarter is the great controversy. So what I want to do right off the bat, 
Uh, if you, if somebody asked you, what is the great controversy? Who can tell me? And I'm going to give you just one sentence. If you had one sentence to explain to somebody what is the great controversy, what would you say? Anybody? Okay, the war between Christ and Satan. Was that mic working? It wasn't then though, right? Guess what? I heard you perfectly. <laughs> and those who have been here for a while know what I mean. <laughs> Stephanie checked me this morning and she said, are you wearing your hearing aids? And I said, I am. I heard you. Brian, you should be really excited. All right. Anybody else? Someone asked what is the great controversy? Yes. Just a second. War between good and evil. The yes. war between good and evil, all right. Okay. Anyone else? We have Isaac right here. Jesus was proving his innocence about his love toward the human as uh, Satan wanted to show that the law of God nobody can follow. Okay. <laughs> You just got checked. <laughs> no, Isaac speaks in paragraphs, not sentences. So, all right. All right, so, so that's just the, the first thing. So think about this idea about the great controversy. Um, the, the, the title of our lesson is The War Behind All Wars. And um, so we're going to jump into that. But I just wanted to also say one other thing. And that is, this quarterly is based on the Great Controversy book, the book, The Great Controversy by Ellen White. So every single lesson, what we will see with the lesson, in, in addition to all the, the passages, is uh, reading for us to read in the book of The Great Controversy. So this week, we were supposed to have read chapters 29 and 30. And hopefully, some people actually did that. If we remember, as we think about this whole concept of the great controversy and what is the great controversy, and if you ask Ellen White that question, I don't know exactly what she would say, but I know what she has written. So if you think of the great controversy series, there are five books in the great controversy series. And remember how it starts, right? So let me just read the first book of the great controversy series is Patriarchs and Prophets. And the opening sentence is, God is love. Amen. His nature, his law, is love. Yes. Um, so that's how that starts. And that's one bookend. It ends with the book, The Great Controversy. And the very last phrase of The Great Controversy is, God is love. Oh. Now let me read that last sentence, though, because it gives some context. She says, the great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness. Throughout the realms of illimitable space, from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. That's incredible, right? So if I were to ask Ellen White, what is the great controversy all about? It might be God is love. Everything in between has to do with proving that God is love. And that's the bottom line, I think, of the great controversy. OK, so we're going to take this lesson today in three sections. The three sections will be what the material covered from Monday and Tuesday. Um, and that relates really to the war in heaven. And then the second piece will be that the war comes to earth. And my favorite piece, and you should not be surprised, is the gospel. <coughs> because the gospel is the answer to everything that happens in the great controversy. So I want you to open the memory text. And the first part of what we're going to talk about is Revelation chapter 12. And um, I'm just going to read the memory text verses that were given to us because that really relates to the war in heaven. So it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 8, and war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, 
and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Okay, that's it. Now, class, we're gonna look at just those two verses. I know people like to go dip down later, but just those two verses. We're gonna finish the passage later, but, but that's those two verses. So what's up? Um, if you look at this verse, it says there was war in heaven. Uh, how could that be? Thank you. War in heaven. Somebody had their hand up? Okay, so it can happen be because we have free choice. I heard of, I think those microphones are for my sake. I might need them, but the people who are looking will need it too, so there. Oh, thank you. Because uh, God gave us the freedom to choose, that showed his love. Okay, yeah. And love can never be forced, yeah. coerced, or legislated. Yeah. As the lesson said, God did not create a devil. He did not. Lucifer was a perfect, beautiful being, but because sin and iniquity entered his heart, because he had a choice, you know, Lucifer chose that he wanted to be as high as the creator. Okay, all right, thank you very much. All right, anybody else? I wanna, I wanna layer this in a little bit, so when you, when you think to yourself, you know, that there was war in heaven, and you say to yourself, that was a perfect place. That's the place to be. You're protected. How in the world would war de uh, develop in heaven in that environment? So let me just layer a couple of texts, and you alluded to them. So um, the first text let's look at is Ezekiel chapter 28. And we know these well. So Ezekiel chapter 28. I'm going to read uh, both of these, actually. Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. So Ezekiel chapter uh, 28 um, says, I'm going to read, I'm going to begin in the middle of the verse so we won't uh, spend time on the king of Tyre, but basically Isaiah is, what's being revealed to him is what's going on behind the scenes of the king of Tyre, what's motivating him. So he says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, and diamond. And then, down in verse 14, it says, You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. So that's one text. Put that one in the back of your mind. And then now let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. What we're trying to discover is how in the world did sin, did, how in the world was there war in heaven? So if you look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, the first line says of Isaiah 14, verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Okay, just looking at that, that phrase, even that sentence, you say to yourself, even heaven is like, how in the world did that happen? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. It doesn't matter what God was going to do to Lucifer. He wasn't happy. He was like those children, all those children who will never be happy whatever the parents will do for them. Otherwise, he wanted to take the power which was reserved to God. Okay, all right. Okay, Dr. Small has got a comment here. Too. <laughs> I think it points out <clears throat> that being abundantly blessed does not provide immunity. The Bible has many examples of people who were very blessed and fell. It reminds us, if I am blessed, just watch out and lean on God totally. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. Anybody else? Let me just read another little piece of this. So the question in verse 12 is, how you have, you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And then it said, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
Did anything in that passage grab your attention as you thought about this? Is there anything in that passage? I. I. I? There's a lot of I going on, right? Yeah. Um, I have learned to count, as if I write something, to count how many times I use the word I. Mm -hmm. And I've determined not to use the word I. Okay. Anything else caught anybody that's the attention in this? Yes, Debbie. The power of the I can hear you. Whoa. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> he wanted all the power that went with the throne, but he wasn't about to lay himself aside. And how many times do we see that on this earth okay. with everything? Yes. Um, Lucifer was first of the covering cherubs. Yes. So does that mean that he was like second in command? But that wasn't good enough. And just like everyone else said, he wanted all the homage to himself. Okay. He wanted to be worshipped. Okay. So. All right. Okay, anybody else? noticed anything in the passage. You know, one thing that really stands out in the, in the passage that really cracks me up, I can't even imagine. He said, he's speaking about I, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Since when did he have a throne? <laughs> he never had a throne. It's just amazing. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Yes, there's a hand over there. Okay. This is good aerobics for me, thank you. <laughs> I think you had just said it. See, Lucifer was not a creator. He was created and not a creator. Okay, all right. Now what's interesting, so that's one thing. So he says he has a throne. I don't know where we got that from, but anyway, he said, um, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. If you look at that, this whole idea of the, the size of the north, that includes like Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, and that's where God's government, the seat of his government, that was the representation of the seat of his government. In other words, he was going to join the government of God and be involved in its divine issues. Um, more specifically, the sanctuary is a reflection of what is in heaven. Yes. We know that. Yes. And if you walk into the sanctuary, on the, what is on the north side? Yes. That is the table of showbread. Yes. The table of showbread has two crowns around the table. The table of showbread has two stacks of bread. Yes. Satan is saying, and that's the throne of God, the yes. Father and the Son. Yes. Satan is saying, I want to be on the north side. That's I right. want to sit on the throne with the Father and the Son. Um, that's what Isaiah is saying here. The same thing that Ellen White says in multiple cases, yeah. you know, that he was envious of the position of Christ. Yes, yes, yes. Just absolutely amazing. And what you also notice, and as we, when we get to the gospel, you see that, that Lucifer, his position, his direction he wanted to go was up. He wanted to go up. That was interesting. All right. Um, so let me just, um, there are some, some things. What, what, what lessons do you learn from this passage in Revelation uh, chapter 12, verse 7 and 8? As we looked at all these three texts, what lessons do you learn just from the heaven part, not from the earth part yet? Yes, Joe. That the battle begins in the heart okay. and the mind. Yes. And that each day... The devil's working that attitude towards all of us. Yes, yes. Okay. It does belong in the beginning in the heart and mind. All right. Anybody else? Lessons you've learned just with this little section here that war broke out in heaven. And that war related to Lucifer wanting to ascend and do something that was not in his prerogative. Any other, any lessons you've learned? Yes. Stephanie. Another thing that it says to me is. Be careful who you're listening to, oh. because it wasn't just him that had to leave. It was a third of the angels. Imagine one third of the angels believed him. Mm. After all they'd seen, they actually believed him. Mm. To me, that's absolutely incredible. Okay, just in the interest of time, let me tell you six things that I want us to add to what has already been shared. And that is, so when you think of the cosmic conflict, think of the great controversy where everything was perfect, heaven was an amazing place, and Lucifer decided it wasn't enough. So point number one about this is evil and the cosmic conflict originated in a perfect heaven. 
So evil originated in a perfect heaven. Nothing was wrong whatsoever. Number two, evil challenged the very idea of God's right to exist and to rule despite the fact that he was eternal. Number three, forget about the weapons. You know, we talk about this war in heaven, it was weapons or not. Forget about the weapons. This conflict is spiritual. Yes. And the solution to the conflict will be a spiritual solution. It's really important. This conflict is spiritual. Four, evil arose against God without any contribution from God and cannot be extinguished from existence without God. And then five, a part of God's character is his justice, and he will deal with evil. And we'll see that coming up. He will deal with evil. If you look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7, it tells you that he's merciful and gracious and full of long suffering and so forth, but he will in no wise clear the guilty. He will deal with evil. And then, one of the most moving things Ellen White said in Great Controversy, uh, page 495, the number, point number six, is that God in his great mercy bore long with Lucifer. Yes. That's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was acting up. I'd have kicked him out long ago. Yes. But she says that God in his great mercy bore long with Lucifer, yes. Before you moving on that page, you said, uh, they said God granted Lucifer the time to repent. If he was going to do that, he would be go back to his position. Yes. But he denied. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So that was the war in heaven. So the war began in heaven. Why it began, we have no clue why it began. But somehow in the heart of Lucifer, who was created perfect, he decided that he was going to be God. And he was going to have the divine prerogatives that were not his. That's how it all started. Now, it came to earth. And I want us to look at back now. Now, if you go back to Revelation chapter 12, we're going to work through this today. So Revelation chapter 12, if you look at um, verses 7 and onwards, actually from verse 1 and onwards, we're not going to do, deal with 1 to 6 today because we have that other lessons. But verse 7 to the end is really an enlargement of verses 1 to 6. So if you look at from verse 7 to verse 12, we're only going to go to verse 10 today, you see that there's something going on in this passage more than just the war that was in heaven. And beginning in what we're going to talk about now, we're going to see that that war came to earth. Okay, so let's just read. I'm going to read verse 9 of Revelation chapter 12. Remember what we said before we came here is that in points 5 and 6 that I just mentioned, that a part of God's character is his justice, and he will deal with evil. He will deal with evil. And um, he bore along with Lucifer, but there is come a time when he's deal with. So, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Remember, this, we read in verse 7 8 that there was war in heaven and that um, Michael and his angels fought, but the, Mike, the, the devil or the dragon and his angels did not prevail. Verse 9 said, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So now with that, we go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, because he was cast out to the earth. So Genesis chapter 3, um, verse 15, excuse me, not verse 15, verse, verse 1, Genesis 3, verse 1 to verse 6 is what we're actually going to look at. Um, let me just read Genesis chapter 3, then I want to ask a question that was asked on Monday's lesson. It says, now the serpent was more cunning. What does cunning mean? Cunning. What is cunning? Deceitful. Deceitful. Okay, so deceitful. It also means subtle. He doesn't come out there with the tail and the red outfit and whatnot like that. He is subtle. So you need to, need to be on our toes because he is subtle, okay? So it says that now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? She gives her response. She said, oh, no, he didn't say that. He said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, we cannot eat of it 
we can't even touch it, lest we die. Verse 4, and the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now, I want you guys to think about this very carefully. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took up its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband um, with her, and he ate. So the question on the bottom of Monday's lesson is this. It says, what lessons can we learn from the battle in heaven that relates to our own personal battle with evil? If Satan was able to deceive these righteous, holy beings, what does this say about his evil attempts to deceive us? In other words, here heaven is this perfect place and um, nothing around to tempt or distort, and they are deceived. One third of them are deceived. And then he comes to us, and we think we can get away with not being involved. So as you looked at these verses that we read in Genesis, can you identify Satan's strategy in dealing with us? He has a strategy, and we see his mind. I think Judy... Yeah, Judy had her hand up. Yeah. Satan accused God of lying. Yes. And that is his character. Yeah. And he's trying to trade his character for God's character. Okay. All right. Yes. Stephanie. <laughs> this says that. Um, oh, thank you. This says that um, she saw that it was good and. She trusted her senses. Oh, yes. Yes, we can't yes. do that. She trusted her senses. Okay, very good. All right, yes. She, there's a mic to you, yeah. I also think another strategy that he used, especially with Eve, is the curiosity mm. of the unknown. And um, he told her that she would know good from evil and she felt that God was hiding something mm. from them. And she believed him because she, as humans, we are curious. Yes. And we like to find out and to search for what we should be looking for. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I told a little kid one time, <laughs> that was opening all kinds of things around my house. I said, you know what, the, what it says about curiosity? He goes, yes, he goes, to kill the cat. <laughs> that was really cute. Curiosity. We are curious by nature. Yes. Go ahead. I think another strategy is that he mixes the truth and falsehood. Yes. God didn't want us to know yes. good and evil. Yes. So that was true. Okay. So he crafts the truth to mix with that yes. falsehood. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes. Right here. Thank you. It's not just for you, yeah. it's for the people that are watching online. Very good. So I think Satan's ultimate strategy can be summed up with just deception. The idea he has behind it is to allow us to be deceived into formulating what our truth is that's yes. substituted for God's truth. Because his truth and our truth is completely contrary to what God's absolute truth is. Yes. I'm, I'm so glad you said that. And we're going to come to that. There's another hand over here. Piggyback, piggybacking on that point and putting this all together, uh, it's interesting to note that, that the great deception starts with self-deception. It starts with, with Lucifer deciding that he was all that and, and, and equal to God, and then going on and deceiving the angels. And then, uh, then he deceives Eve. Eve sees that the tree is good, and it's all, it's, and it's all that, yeah. and is able to go on and, and, and deceive Adam. So the deception starts at self-deception. Okay, thank you very much. Now let me summarize because I want to get to the gospel. Um, the very first thing that Lucifer did, you guys nailed all the points. Very first thing in verse 1 was an attack on God's trustworthiness. He caused you to question God's trustworthiness, to doubt God. That's his first step. That's his strategy. He asked you a question. Did you say that? And you begin to think, maybe not. It's kind of like, when, you, when your parents, your friends, like your kids tell their friends, 
My parents said I have to be home by 10. And the kid thinks that's great until they meet their friends. And the friend says, did your parents really tell you that? My parents are mean. Mm. It's very interesting. The very first step is to, to doubt God, to raise questions about God. It is also in our nature to decide what is truth, that we can decide. Basically what he's saying, he, he, acted, he said that God intentionally deceived you because he knows that as soon as you eat that tree, you'll be like God. And then, trusting him, she saw that it was good, it was pleasant to the eyes, and so forth. Um, we cannot trust our senses, how things feel, our own imagination. And the fact of the matter is only God. If you look today, um, one of the things I wrote down here is that if you look today at how people think, um, Unfortunately, we have been cherry picking the scriptures and we're deciding what we think is really true and relevant to the culture today. And we decide that in the 21st century, the Bible is not fully applicable. There have been changes, that things they didn't understand before. Some things are now genetic all of a sudden and so forth. And so truth is becoming something that we decide what it is and not what God says it is. So we, um, we learned some lessons from this about Satan's strategy. And if you look at what's happening today, the strategy is working out in our society today. All right. Anybody have the last comment? Joanne, there's a microphone here. Joanne. knowledgeable on that particular job. He was a covering angel. When we think of angels, we think of protection, but he was a covering cherub. So in the earthly temple, the covering cherubims were covering the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. So his specialty mm -hmm. is the gospel. Yes. That is what he's going to attack. He's yes. super knowledgeable on the gospel. That was his role yes. in heaven as a covering angel. Yes. And so that's his specific focus. Yes. That is really good. And he wants to distort the gospel. We have to believe that. That's the case. That's what he wants to do. OK. Thank you, Melissa. Fantastic. All right. So let's go to, um, let me, uh, let's go to, um, back to, to Revelation chapter 12. And, um, what we see here, the transition that was made from, the, from verse 8 and then verse, 10, uh, verse 9 on to verse 12 is that the war has come to earth. And so it says in verse 10, I'm just going to read uh, verse, verse 9 and 10 again. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, and the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice say, saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of, God, of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. How is it that the accuser of the brethren, and I believe that that's referring to what happened on earth with Jesus Christ. So how was the accuser of the brethren finally cast down? What cast him down? And what does that all mean? What's being spoken of in this verse? Ron. Boy, you are getting your exercise today. <laughs> the cross is ultimately what cast him down. Yes, yes. And Lucifer, taking the story of Job, still had access to heaven. Yes. Satan was not fully expelled from heaven until after the cross. Yes, OK. The reason that we understand that this particular passage is not just speaking about heaven, but also the earth and what happened after Jesus Christ died on the cross, heaven is rejoicing. I have an incredible quote about that. Heaven begins to rejoice because they understand, the remaining angels understand that is the truth, that is the gospel. He's not selfish. He's not trying to deny us anything. Um, and the cross is what purges us. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, very quickly, there's so many uh, things here, that, a text that we can get to, and I want to. Um, in terms of, I mentioned that the great controversy, the cosmic conflict, is a spiritual issue and can only be answered um, spiritually, and that God will answer the question. So 
If you look at back at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. As you look at that passage, this is the first preaching of the gospel. What is important is that, and one of the things that, that it, it really appealed to me was that if you're looking at the seed of the woman, that is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ and the Godhead do not get away unscathed in this battle. There is damage that will be done, but the greatest damage will be that Jesus Christ would crush the head of Satan um, and his heel would be bruised. He was crucified, but he rose again and he was, he was, he was crucified on our behalf. I want to look at several texts as we go through this. But the cross of Jesus Christ, Ellen White has a quote, that the cross of Jesus Christ uprooted any kind of rebellion that was in the heart of all the angels. The cross of Christ is powerful. It's very powerful. So let me just take us through a couple of texts here. Um, Galatians chapter 4, we don't have to turn there, but Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5 says that when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, um, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Isn't that wonderful? When the fullness of the time had come, the promise was given in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and then when the fullness of the time had come, God set forth the Son as he had promised. Okay. Um, if you look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, this is probably one of the best ones. The bell is wrong. We have five seconds left. That's five minutes, but anyway. But Philippians chapter 2, um, verse 5 says here, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Is that, that's the difference, right? As you, as you begin to look at this passage, you see there's a difference between how Lucifer was thinking and how Jesus Christ was thinking. Lucifer was saying, I wanna be like the most high God. And here we have in Philippians chapter two, it said that he did not consider robbery to be equal with God. So what does that phrase mean? He didn't consider robbery to be equal with God. What does that phrase mean? Yes. It says he humbled himself. Self okay. Sacrifice. He did not consider his divinity something to be grabbed hold of when there was a will that was lost. So if it meant giving up everything that was rightfully his to come to this plant to save us, he was willing to do it, to step down, to humble himself. And then the rest of the text tells us what, what the stepping down looked like. So it said, who being in the form of God did not consider Robbie to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And then being found in appearance of, of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is powerful. When you think about um, what it would take to get the lies that Satan had said, or Lucifer had said in heaven, out of the hearts and minds of the people, it would take the death of Jesus Christ. This is absolutely amazing. Okay, so uh, if you look at Hebrews chapter two, um, Hebrews chapter two, further expounding on what Paul said in, in Philippians, Hebrews chapter 2, and it's verse 9. I love this. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. What death is being spoken of? It's the second death. He was willing to lose his life eternally, so that we could be saved, and that's what it would take. Mm. All right. And then I just want to read the last text, and that's, well, two last texts. They're all in Hebrews. Continuing in chapter 2 in Hebrews, it says, therefore, so it says that he might taste death for everyone. It goes and says several things, and it says here, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, mm. that he might be a merciful, and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And then, so in other words, he came very close to mankind. 
The quarterly gave us this verse in Hebrews chapter 4, verse um, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let's stop there for a minute because we don't have, we have about a minute left. When Jesus Christ came to this earth and humbled himself and emptied himself, he joined himself to humanity, the human race. Ellen White said, with cords that will never be broken, he joined himself to the human race. And forever, God, Jesus Christ, has given up things that were his by native right. He has given up forever for, on our behalf. So he joined himself to, to humanity with cords that will never be broken. He took upon himself a nature that needed to be redeemed. He was without sin, but he took upon himself that nature. Verse 16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Very powerful. Before I read the last quote, does anybody want to comment on those texts? I want to have a quote from Ellen White and we'll be done. Anybody want to comment on, on um, the text we just read or the quotes we've shared? Okay. Let me read this last quote then. Ellen White says this, Satan had accused God of seeking merely the exaltation of himself in requiring submission of, and obedience from his creatures and had declared that while the creator exalted self, exacted self-denial from others, he himself practiced no self-denial and made no sacrifice. Now it was seen that for the salvation of a fallen and sinful race, the ruler of the universe had made the greatest sacrifice which love could make. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was seen also that while Lucifer had opened the door for the entrance of sin by his desire for honor and supremacy, Christ had in order to destroy sin humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Then she says this, this is in Desire of Ages, by shedding the blood of the Son of God, Satan had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings, the last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. And ultimately, that's what God wants to have happen with us, that the last link that we have with sin, because of the power of the cross and what's demonstrated there, will have nothing to do with Satan at all. So I want to leave you with three points. First point, evil originated in a perfect heaven. That's number one. Number two, this conflict is spiritual in nature and must have a spiritual solution. And number three, God will deal with evil. Yes. And that's what the big introduction to the Sabbath school lesson for the day. Wow. All right. So let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you are so good. We cannot comprehend that the love that you have for us, we can only behold. And I pray, Lord, that you open our minds, that we will have the insight that we need, the appreciation of the depth of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf personally. And may we make a personal commitment that we will forsake anything that draws us into enemy territory and that we will devote ourselves to coming closer to you, to allowing your Holy Spirit to speak to us, convicting us of the need in our lives. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. May we be your witnesses for Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. And indeed, Pastor Finley told